Disseminated intravascular coagulation caused by pathological activation of coagulation cascade. DAC has two phases. Initially hypercoagulation develops, and then hypercoagulation is changed by hypocoagulation. DAC always occurs secondary to another disease, so there are certain conditions that can induce hypercoagulation phase of DAC. Before the pathology, we have to recall normal hemostasis. So, if damage to endothelial cell occurs, endothelium that was contained inside the endothelial cell will be released into the bloodstream and will cause transient vasoconstriction. After vasoconstriction, organism has to immediately cover and repair the damage area. In order to do this, endothelial cells release from weighable palladi bodies huge amount of von Willebrand factor. In the bloodstream, von Willebrand factor binds to subendothelial collagen under the disrupted endothelial cell. After that, platelets come to the site of injury and by the specific receptor GP1B, they bind to von Willebrand factor. And exactly this simple step called platelets adhesion. After the adhesion, platelets become activated. In response to this, they undergo shape change that results in their degranulation. With degranulation, platelets release the content inside them, including the dense granules that contain ADP. ADP that is released into the blood acts on ADP receptor on platelets and activate it. Activation of ADP receptor forces platelets to transport GP2B3 receptor to the surface, where GP2B3 serves as binding site for fibrinogen. In addition to this, platelets from prostaglandins by COX enzyme begin to produce thromboxane A2, and the function of thromboxane A2 is to promote aggregation. When fibrinogen notices a GP2B3 receptor on platelet surface, fibrinogen immediately binds to GP2B3, and when another platelet comes to the site of injury, platelet immediately binds by GP2B3 to fibrinogen. And this process is significantly accelerated by thromboxane A2. This binding occurs over and over again until platelet plaque will be formed. And exactly this gathering of platelets at the site of injury called aggregation. And aggregation results in formation of a platelet plaque. But platelet plaque is weak, and to stabilize it, to make it formidable, we have secondary hemostasis. The function of the secondary hemostasis is to make from weak platelet plaque a formidable structure that called thrombus. And the thing that makes this platelet plaque formidable is conversion of unstable fibrinogen into a stable fibrin. Secondary hemostasis is provided by coagulation factors that form coagulation cascade. The central factor of coagulation cascade is factor 10. The goal of both intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways is to activate factor 10. Intrinsic pathway consists of factors from 12 to 8. Extrinsic pathway consists of just factor 7. Activation of factor 10 results in activation of factors 5, 2 and 1. Factor 2 called prothrombin that with activation becomes thrombin. And factor 1 called fibrinogen that with activation becomes fibrin. And exactly fibrin makes from platelet plaque a formidable thrombus. So secondary hemostasis converts platelet plaque into a thrombus. To assess the extrinsic pathway, we use prothrombin time and international normalized ratio. For assessment of intrinsic pathway, we use partial thromboplastin time. The first factor that can cause DAC is obstetric complications. The reason is that amniotic fluid contains tissue thromboplastin, and one of the tissue thromboplastin components is tissue factor. As we know, tissue factor is a strong activator of factor 7. So if amniotic fluid leaks into the blood circulation, Potentially, it can cause strong pathologic activation of extrinsic coagulation pathway. The second condition is sepsis. In sepsis, there are a lot of bacteria in the circulation, and some of the bacteria are gram-negative. And as we know, gram-negative bacteria in their walls contain a lot of endotoxin, which is lipopolysaccharide. And lipopolysaccharide is a strong activator of factor 7. Another disorder that can cause DAC is acute promyelocytic leukemia. The concept is that in acute promyelocytic leukemia, there are a lot of promyelocytes in the blood. 
and the specific feature of promyelocytes is that they contain inside them a huge amount of myeloperoxidase and crystallized myeloperoxidase, also known as our rods. The specific feature of myeloperoxidase is that this enzyme has proteolytic activity. And because it can cleave proteins, it can massively activate all coagulation factors at once, thereby activating entire coagulation cascade. Because recall that, in fact, all coagulation factors are proteases that are initially exist in the circulation in inactivated state. Their activation occurs by proteolytic cleavage. In normal condition, this cleavage is provided by another activated coagulation factor. Let's say activated factor 9 cleaves a small part of inactivated factor 8, and this cleavage results in activation of factor 8. That in turn will cleave a part of factor 10, thereby activating him. And this process is repeated over and over again. But in pathological condition, this cleavage can be provided by any enzyme that has proteolytic activity. It can be myeloperoxidase, it can be pancreatic enzymes, as trypsin, it can be snake's venom. So there are a lot of possibilities how this pathological cleavage can occur. As we mentioned, in other disorders that can cause massive activation of coagulation factors are acute pancreatitis and snake bites. In all cases, such a strong activation of coagulation factors finally will cause formation of a massive amount of thrombi. Why thrombi formation is so dangerous? First of all, thrombus can cause obstruction of the blood vessel. And obstruction typically can cause ischemia of the lower limbs. Obstruction of the coronary circulation can cause myocardial infarction. Obstruction of the brain vessels can cause stroke. And also thrombi can cause obstruction of the pulmonary circulation that will cause pulmonary embolism. So, as we see in hypercoagulation phase of DAC, the major problem is formation of a massive amount of thrombi that can cause ischemia, infarction or pulmonary embolism. But then the second phase develops. And now we should realize that once coagulation factor is activated, it's a wasted product. We cannot use this factor for the second time. So with massive activation of coagulation factors, after a short period of time, we do not have any coagulation factors left. So total amount of coagulation factors decrease. Thereby intrinsic, extrinsic and common coagulation pathways become disrupted. Disruption of intrinsic pathway will cause prolongation of PTT. Disruption of extrinsic pathway will cause prolongation of PT and international normalized ratio. So entire secondary hemostasis is not working properly. Disruption of the secondary hemostasis clinically manifests with deep tissue bleeding. Typically it's hematomas, hemarthrosis and even intracranial bleeding. In addition to this, we have to understand that thrombus is basically a lot of platelets that are connected by fibrinogen that then becomes fibrin. So with a lot of thrombi formation, a lot of platelets are used. Increase in platelets consumption will cause decrease in platelet count, and decrease in platelet count will disrupt primary hemostasis that will manifest this prolongation of the bleeding time. Also because primary hemostasis is not working properly, this will manifest this typical mucus type of bleeding. In DAC mostly it's bleeding from mucocytes and microhemorrhages. So as we see both primary and secondary hemostasis are not working properly. And because of that blood even oozing from the puncture sites. So it's a very severe condition with high mortality rate. Also because a lot of fibrinogen molecules are consumed for thrombus formation, the amount of fibrinogen decreases. In addition to this, if thrombus will cause significant obturation of the blood vessel, it's very hard for erythrocyte to squeeze through this site of obstruction. Basically, this thrombus will cleave red blood cells on two, and these damaged red blood cells called schistocytes. Once thrombus is formed, thrombus should be removed. To remove thrombus, our organism activates fibrinolysis, and with fibrinolysis, plasmin degrades fibrin and the product of fibrin degradation called D-dimer. So because in DAC a massive amount of thrombi are formed, this will result in formation of a massive amount of D-dimer. So D-dimer level will be significantly elevated. 
So diagnostic criteria for DAC are decreasing coagulation factors. For this purpose, we determine the amount of factor 5 and 8. In addition to this, disruption of both pathways in secondary hemostasis will cause prolongation of PTT, PT and international normalized ratio. Also, the amount of platelets decrease. This will disrupt primary hemostasis and will cause prolongation of the bleeding time. Low fibrinogen concentration and the presence of schistocytes are also a characteristic of features. And important that due to the fibrinolysis, the concentration of D-dimer will be significantly elevated. So there is a list of diagnostic criteria that we already discussed. The treatment depends on the phase of DAC, but in both cases we should treat the underlying factors that provoke DAC. If it's phase 1 with extensive clotting, to correct this we can provide infusion of heparin. Because as we know heparin activates antithrombin, in response to this inhibitory effect of antithrombin becomes more potent, so factor 2 and 10 becomes less active. Thereby fibrin formation will decrease and without fibrin thrombus cannot be formed. If it's phase 2 with hypocoagulation, then we should provide transfusion of plasma or cryoprecipitate. This will increase the concentration of clotting factors and thereby will improve secondary hemostasis. And also we should provide transfusion of platelets that will increase the platelet count, thereby correcting the primary hemostasis. If you like content, please press like and subscribe button. All the best!